So the topic for this evening is whose responsibility is food waste? Um, we're going to hear from a couple of speakers this evening. Um, B's going to be Brown from Kent Sustainable Food is going to um, demonstrate and talk to us a little bit about the tools that we developed for our zero um, carbon campaign food for our future, um, which uh, is, is all about encouraging individuals and households to reduce their food waste. And then we've got Brian Mills um, from South Cam's District Council, um, and he's going to talk to us about the role of the policymaker. Um, that will be followed by um, some breakout groups where you'll get the opportunity to um, get to grips with a couple of thorny questions we've posed for you um, this evening. So um, time is quite tight. We only have an hour, so um, we're going to be a bit of a, a gallop through. Um, so if you could keep your microphones off, um, and if you have any questions, we'll try and pick them up um, at the end of the session. Um, so uh, you can pop them in the chat, or if you have any information or comments, you just want to let people know, um, pop them in the chat as well. Um, we are going to record the session, so if you don't want to be recorded, please turn your um, video off, and if you right click on your um, uh, image, you will be able to um, change your name or, or rename yourself, so you can just take your name out. Um, we're not going to be using the, the video for anything other than um, writing a blog post um, and capturing what people have said. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, I work for Cambridge Sustainable Food. Cambridge Sustainable Food is a community interest company. We have been in existence for the past five years and we sit um, underneath a national umbrella called Sustainable Food Places, um, which is run by Sustain and the Soil Association. Um, there's a network of cities. We were one of the earliest sign, signed up. We have generally worked um, within the uh, within Cambridge City itself, um, but I have been doing more and more work um, out in the county and finding um, county partners, including South Cams, to work uh, alongside. Uh, we have a bronze uh, level award um, and are uh, galloping towards our silver this year, hopefully, and then on to gold. And to give you a, an idea, it's a pretty tough um, system to get through and there's only two cities in the UK with a gold award and as you probably would expect or know that would be Brighton and Bristol. Um, the next slide just gives, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but it just gives you I think the, the scope of um, the work that we and the ambition that we have in our work which is the whole food system. So everything and most recently over the past year, we've been working a lot with the um, food in the food poverty realm. Um, obviously there's been, um, given the pandemic, there's been a lot of um, people that have needed assistance over the past year, but we're also um, exceptionally committed to tackling the climate and nature emergencies. And um, this is where the, the food waste um, issue sits with us. Um, we work with businesses, we work with local communities, we work with local authorities, we work with policy makers, we'll work with anybody we can and um, who will work with us to, to promote sustainable food. Um, so most recently we've been running the Zero Carbon Communities campaign um, and that is very much in two parts. Um, part two is to come. Um, later on this year, but part one was about reducing food waste um, with residents. Now, obviously, we've had to take the Food for Future campaign online, um, which is um, which B will take take us through some of those tools. Um, it's been it's been a learning experience to take everything online, as I'm sure everybody will appreciate and has had to do themselves over the past year. Um, previous campaigns that we have run have included um, campaigns to do with Love Food, Hate Waste, the Sainsbury's Waste Less to Save More campaign a couple of years ago, obviously Zero Carbon Communities, um, and some of the, the activities that we've undertaken 
with that has been things such as we did a pump stunt where we filled uh, a monthly, um, sorry, an annual um, household's waste into a punt and uh, yes, had a lots of media um, attention around there. We run the pumpkin festival in Cambridge, which um, attracts over 3000 um, visitors. And that's very much inviting the, the whole community to get, in, to get involved. Um, it usually happens around um, October. Um, and as you know, that lots of pumpkin goes to waste around that time. So lots of children's activities, fringe activities, and a sort of a, a showcase piece of a, a farmer's market. Um, we've done Ready Steady Cook, um, surplus food with some local celebrity chefs, which was some of the most fun I've ever had. Um, and um, we've also run the Taste Not Waste um, campaign with local businesses. Um, and it was a, a campaign to help businesses measure their food waste um, through using um, a method, a, a toolkit developed by RAP. Um, so we, we also, alongside that, we're encouraging businesses to start recycling their food waste um, and to adopt food waste policies um, as best practice. Um, and some of the successes out of those ca that campaign was Selwyn College um, reduced their place, plate waste by 12%. Um, Cambridge Cookery School became the first city's zero food waste cafe. Um, and at Smokeworks, um, they measured their food waste and, and their, their, the food that came off people's plates um, that, was, that was wasted. And they discovered that 64% of the food that was put on that plate was going into, into the bin. So as a result, they changed, um, they did some behavior change and they changed the way in which they operated, doing things like um, different portion sizes for one, um, optional sort of things like s'mores or side dishes so that people could, could um, you know, build their own plate as it were, rather than being um, given a whole big plate of food. And the tickle arms um, who uh, compost started composting um, in their restaurant gardens um, to feed their vegetable patches, which in turn um, feeds their restaurant. Um, food waste policies were adopted by six businesses: uh, Cambridge Cookery School, Edge Cafe, Selwyn College, Sydney Sussex, um, and Novi. Um, so, no strangers to food waste. Um, and for me, there's some common themes that, or some common issues that, that sort of, that seem to jump out at me or transcend across all of these sort of um, projects that we've run in the past, including this latest one, which is Zero Carbon Communities. And it is, you know, you can see them here on the right and um, it, it's not rocket science, <laughs> um, but some of the issues are about how do you engage people? How, how, how do you engage people? And then, how do you really how do you really measure how people have changed their, their habits? Um, people find it difficult to invest their, their time um, and um, sometimes their money into making um, those changes that are really needed. Um, some of the successes. Um, the media seems to love food waste um, and um, I think that's a fantastic opportunity is to get it into the media um, and press uh, as much as possible. Um, but people tell us on an individual case by case basis that actually they have changed and, and what the, 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 stuff, the stuff that they've engaged with has, has, has had a meaning um, for them. Um, community fridges seem to be a flavor of the flavor of the year um, and there's a great national um, network of fridges run by Hubbub um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, community fridges are mm, about uh, using surplus or gathering surplus food from businesses and from individual households, um, putting them in a fridge and then allowing anybody who wants to take that food um, out of those fridges and use it. Um, for us, businesses seem to have the deeper um, engagement um, rather than individuals in anything that we have run and that have made some of the, the biggest changes. And that I think is, is for, for a few reasons. One of them obviously is that they can see the, the benefit in terms of money um, returned and the savings. Um, plus it is, it is great, great publicity. Um, and um, one of the other great 
successes that has come out of the past year is the network that has been set up in Cambridge around surplus food redistribution. Um, we are uh, we administrate a, a WhatsApp group. WhatsApp seems to be uh, the way in which people organise uh, these days. But uh, the WhatsApp group of about forty organisations and agencies who are sharing any surplus food that they might have around and in amongst themselves. So that's sort of the background, um, as it as it were, to to our work uh, and what we do. So the question, and it's, it is a bit of a false dichotomy, but um, it, it's, uh, it's a starting point, I guess, and in a way it sort of feeds into narratives around what food waste is and whose responsibility is it. We hear a lot about individual responsibility for food waste um, and um, looking at these figures we can see that actually the the amount of food waste that comes out of households in the UK surpasses the 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 food waste by industry um, what we do know though is a third of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the food industry which is staggering um, uh, and um, so that so, but we know, knowing that, that households outstrip in terms of, um, of, of wastage more than industry, um, knowing, and knowing exactly what's going on though within those households and what the barriers are to behaviour change is really elusive, it can be really elusive, it can be really difficult to really understand what influences people's um, behaviour over a long period. It's fine to engage people through a campaign, or a challenge for a week or two, but you know, how do we know that, that that's really hit the mark five years later, a year later, 10 years later? Um, I don't know whether any of you are uh, in public health, but if I talk to any public health colleagues um, about their behavior change, um, they, they'll tell you the behavior change ha happens very slowly. Um, it happens over generations, tens of years, and, and not just you know within days or weeks. Um, so the work that we do now is, is difficult to measure um, and yet who knows what the collective impact is of all the different, different um, campaigns and awareness raising initiatives that we, we do now um, will have um, down the line. Um, something I noticed that came out uh, this week, so recently, the um, Independent um, ran an article that um, highlights that one French supermarket um, outperforms a whole sector in the UK. So this is sort of looking at it from, from the other angle, not just about uh, individuals, but um, so data obtained from Carrefour, everybody hopefully, well, most people have heard of Carrefour. Um, it's the second largest supermarket in France, um, shows that in 2020, they donated nearly 31 tons of food from their French supermarkets. Um, and that exceeded all the donations from UK supermarkets by about 6,000 tonnes. Um, and that's mainly due to legislation and policy introduced in France in 2016. Um, and that offers tax breaks, incentives and legislation um, to discourage the dumping of edible, edible food. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a, a distinction that's worth drawing out when we talk about food waste. Um, some of it's edible, some of it isn't. Um, and really um, what we do with, with both of those sort of uh, two categories is, is key, I think. Um, so in the UK, the UK, I mean, um, and Brian, uh, hopefully you're going to cover this a bit more um, and um, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, I am no expert in this field, but um, the UK government does very little to intervene in the donation of surplus food. So that, food that is edible um, um, and the lack of le legislation and policy um, I was quite shocked to, to hear it's sort of the, it's been highlighted during the pandemic so um, the, gov the government subsidized the purchasing of 10.5 million pounds worth of food um, through the charity fair share um, when we could have you know if legislation had been different in terms of um, donating surplus, surplus food um, we might have been in a, a better prepared situation and um, that that food going into landfill um, as 
rather than um, the 10.5 million pounds being spent on um, on new food. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap up. Um, we can't solve the, the climate and the emergency, I don't feel, without a real overhaul of the whole of the food supply chain. Um, and that means impacting behaviour change, legislation, land use, um, and um, yes, 30% of agricultural land that is grown on, um, the food is, is, you might as well bin that food because that's what happens to it. So that's the, that's the amount that doesn't get eaten. So 30% 30, 30 of the agricultural land that we grow crops on um, globally. Anyway, thanks. If you have any questions or comments or information, then please drop them in the chat um, and we'll see what time we have left at the end. Um, I'm going to introduce you to B now, um, who developed the online campaign tools um, for the Zero Carbon Communities Food for Our Future campaign. Um, as I've mentioned, we weren't able to run this campaign face to face with people. We would love to, and a lot of our work is often around running stalls and festivals and cook-alongs and community meals and um, all those sort of really fun things that we're all itching to get out and do again. Um, but she's made a great, great job and I'd like to thank her right now for taking on such a huge um, challenge of actually pivoting so fast from uh, delivering face-to-face um, -to, -face to delivering online. Um, yeah, it certainly was a huge challenge. So thanks, Dee. Thank you, Sam. Thanks. Um, as uh, Sam mentioned, we ran uh, the campaign to support local communities in South Cairns reducing their carbon footprint. And this part of the campaign tackled reducing uh, the food that they waste. So over four weeks in November, uh, we asked people to sign up to an online challenge and we used our website pages to offer different tips and recipes and we emailed the participants every week um, encouraging them to try a different food um, habit, a food waste reducing habit each week. So uh, including things like using the freezer more and um, using a shopping list when going out shopping. So simple tools like that. And each week we suggested a, a new habit. Um, thank you, Sam. Next. And uh, so for our launch event, we hosted an online screening of the film Just Eat It, a food waste story by Canadian filmmakers Grant Baldwin and Jen Rustmeyer. And it's a really great film. It's won lots of awards. Um, we were really delighted to share it with the guests at the launch. Um, and we followed the film with a discussion around sustainability with local speakers, including Brian. Thank you, Brian, <laughs> back again tonight. Um, and the guests really enjoyed the evening. We had some really good feedback. People found it quite thought provoking and informative. And even though the film's a few years old, I think the um, message is still very much uh, is unchanged. Um, next. Um, so we also hosted some live cook-alongs using Zoom, which was great because it allowed people to kind of have a real sense of socialising together, enjoying cooking together and talking about food waste and recipes. Even though we couldn't be together, it kind of felt like a social event, which was great. Um, just before Halloween, we had um, a cook along for families using pumpkins. So something like 12 million pumpkins get wasted every Halloween. So James Shepherd from the Let's Cook project did a fabulous cook along using lots of pumpkins. So we did some smoky baked beans with grated pumpkin inside and also some pumpkin muffins, which were great. Uh, and then Rosie Sykes, who's another local um, food writer and local chef, she uh, also used lots of pumpkin, but she also made a uh, bread and butter pudding, which was really popular. And we waste something like 20 million slices every day. So it was a fantastic recipe for using up stale bread. And she also made some uh, pumpkin uh, and split pea bulgur wheat, which was really delicious. Um, and finally, we had another cook along, which uh, we asked participants of the challenge to send in 
a shelfie, which is something that Rap started, uh, the idea of um, taking a photograph of your fridge before you go shopping. But we asked people to send what was lurking in their fridge drawer. And the chefs Lucy Robinson and Hilary Caccio came up with some great uh, recipe ideas, including using up leftover cauliflower leaves, which was fantastic. Um, next. Thank you, Sam. Um, so we um, felt it was important to include children in the Food for Our Future campaign. We know that children can have a positive impact on their parents' behaviour. So we went out to the Histon allotment uh, and we recorded two environmental stories there. So Compost Stew and Don't Waste Your Food, which are two really great books for kids. Um, so we read them aloud, we recorded them and we met a couple of the creatures of the compost down there. So Woody the Woodlouse and Cedric the Centipede made an appearance. Uh, and we were also uh, kindly given an interview by John Kay, who's a sort of guru, compost guru from the allotment. Um, and he gave us an interview on all things compost. So all of these um, videos are available on our YouTube channel, which I will put a link to in the chat. And I think we have one more slide, Sam. Uh, yeah, so we also had, um, during each week of the challenge, we shared a new cookery demo from one of our local chefs who generously supported uh, the campaign with their time and their recipes. So we asked them to each pick a sort of commonly food wasted, uh, commonly wasted item. So James, again, bread featured, but he made, um, using stale breadcrumbs made what's known in Italy as poor man's parmesan, so pan grattato, which is a really great way to use up um, stale bread. Um, Leo from Jack's Gelato chose to um, share a recipe for a lockdown favorite. It's become a lockdown favorite banana bread. So he made some muffins, um, which is a great recipe again, and they're all available online. So I will share a link to those in the chat. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Bea. Um, fantastic. Um, please, yes, please do use those resources. And um, if you want links or um, you want more information or if you want to embed them in, in your own websites, do just give us a shout. Um, so I'd like to bring us on to looking at the role of the, uh, the policymaker. Um, thanks, Brian, for, for being with us. Um, Councillor Brian Mills um, was elected to South Cam's District Council in May. Um, 2018, um, becoming part of the new Lib Dem group that formed the new administration. Um, he's been a major contributor to the formation and enactment of new council policies, including Green to the Core, um, and last year became a cabinet member taking responsibility for environmental services and licensing. Brian, welcome. Um, Brian's going to try and, in 10 minutes, um, uh, investigate the barriers facing policymakers um, and how we overcome those barriers and how can we make wasting food as acceptable as something like listering or non-recycling. Take it away Brian, thank you. So would you like to um, close my slide down because I'm, I'm sort of wanting to wave my arms around in a Magnus Pike sort of way and, and across along a visual aid Absolutely. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. I'm, I'll come back to those in a moment. So, yeah, unusually, I, I, I was explaining to uh, Sam and B earlier, I don't really think of myself as a politician yet. I only joined a political party in 2015 and rather accidentally stood for election and, and, and got elected three years or so ago. So, um, but it is interesting that I'm now effectively one of the policy makers that um, you're, you've been asking about. Um, and so let's let's talk about legislation because B, um, oh sorry, no, uh, Sam mentioned legislation. I've got a rather old and tatty doc document here, which is the uh, government's um, white paper on waste resources and their strategy for England. Unfortunately, it's been delayed by six months. But within there, there's a lot of good talk. And I'm not going to uncover his face, but Michael Gove is in there. 
So I'll leave him covered up. But actually, he came up with some very good uh, suggestions, or at least his team did. Um, um, and um, there's a lot of reference, for example, to um, circular uh, economy, which is a phrase that is still uh, new to many in the uh, in the population. And, and this is a, a critical part, I believe, of raising the awareness uh, of all of these issues. Um, I don't think until fairly recently I was aware that a third of the um, food that we produce in the world goes to waste. It doesn't get consumed. This is an astonishing figure that actually we're producing 50% more food than we consume. So, you know, the awareness of that, this is why the value of these, um, uh, we're on Food Waste Action Week this week. But that is good. It's good news that we're uh, raising awareness and actually um, feeding back into policy, doing it evidence-based wise. We've heard a lot of figures tonight about how much waste we're uh, producing. You know, 15 to 25% of our shopping our food shopping is wasted. That's an awful lot of money that we're spending <laughs> on not consuming stuff. So, you know, if if we add that to the 20% of the food that's left behind in the field, does anybody has anybody been gleaning? <laughs> I've done it a couple of times. It's great fun. And it's like for free. This is this is great news. And, and the farmers leave it behind. We, we have a few uh, locally. I did go online to see there's a gleaning um, uh, organisation. And the nearest ones I could find uh, locally were Peterborough and Chelmsford. So if you're um, uh, particularly interested, I'm, sh I'm sure they would love volunteers locally to organise gleaning clubs. And what a great idea. What a great idea for the kids. Take them out into the fields and get free food. I think that's a lovely idea. So this is uh, all about the awareness of the problem and how, how we might fix it. The, the fact that the, this food waste, I think uh, Sam already mentioned, is, is um, a major contribution to greenhouse gases. So it's a directly feel, feeding into the climate change we're suffering from. I was at a meeting earlier this week uh, which was reviewing the, the uh, flood situation that we had locally uh, in Cambridgeshire uh, uh, in December and January. In fact, uh, you may remember Storm Bella, um, but she didn't deposit as much as she threatened to locally. And yet we still had the third worst uh, uh, flooding on record or the amount, third highest amount of rainfall. Fortunately, it was uh, over a, a longer period and didn't cause the devastation that it could, but some places were badly affected. So, so more and more people are becoming aware of the direct consequences of, of climate change. And talking about water, this is where the potatoes are going to make a, uh, a show. I don't know. Um, does anybody know how many uh, cubic metres of water go into uh, a tonne of potatoes? It's a huge amount, and we grow quite a lot of potatoes here. So they've got to, but they've got to, so 22 cubic metres per tonne of potatoes. But when I was peeling these potatoes, I looked at the thing and thought, what, what, what's, what's this? It's a, a little less than perfect potatoes. <laughs> these are these are ugly vegetables, but look, they're lovely and tasty. <laughs> and that's the that's the sort of thing we need to do. So good on Waitrose, you know, they're they're selling, and they say, where is it? Yes, helping to reduce food waste. So it's part part of the collaboration between government, local government, local authorities, volunteer groups is to feed into that awareness, um, make it a thing. Who knew how devastating uh, the plastic in our society was to our oceans and our food chain until David Attenborough came along and told us how, how bad it was. Some of us might have known beforehand, but that was certainly a big part of bringing it into public awareness. Hugh, uh, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall has already done some very good work 
uh, on food waste. You'll have seen seen some of his programs as part of it. He's going and shaming the the, the supermarkets for for the for the waste that they encourage. The example of Carrefour in 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 France is remarkable, isn't it? That that by a combination of willingness and legislation, they've produced. A, a, a massive turnaround of what they do with their food waste. So we've got to encourage our supermarkets to do the same, while ever there's a lack of legislation to encourage them to do it, and then encourage our legislators to make sure that they add their bit to the equation. You know, so it's com combination, isn't it? There's always it's been a tension between persuasion and prohibition. And we may need to do like we have with many things like smoking and seat belt waiting uh, wearing we've had to do a combination of those things and the um uh the waste uh food that we're producing you know there's a hierarchy of, of needs for that stuff so the first it has to feed people then it has to feed animals and then it has to feed energy and then it has to feed compost and finally if there's absolutely no alternative do a bit of landfill but that's what we need to make sure people understand is the, pro is the process. Um, so I think the, uh, the, the lack of awareness is the key barrier and uh, the improving awareness is, is the task that we need to take on board. And there's, there's, that's actually good news in here. Going back to my bag of very lovely potatoes, they were cheaper, I saved money by buying ugly vegetables. So save money while saving the planet. It's not a bad little idea, is it? So that's um, uh, where I'm, I'm coming from. I'm more than happy to take any, any questions, but I've probably uh, done my time in a little bit over, so thank you. Thank you very, very much, Brian. Um, if there are any questions, then we can come back to them um, towards the end if we, we have time. So um, now it's over to you lot. Um, and I, I'm just going to share my screen again to show you the questions that we have um, prepared. Maybe I can copy them, drop them in the um, chat as well, so you've still got... Um, okay, so here's the tricksy questions I uh, prepared earlier. Um, if I B, could you try and copy them and put them in the chat? I don't know whether whether that will work. Um, yeah, so, that's fine. I'll do that. Okay, thank you. And then you'll be able to see them as as well because I'll I'll move away from the screen in a minute. So we have we have two questions here. As I said before, it is a bit of a false dichotomy to to say is it legislators or is it the individual responsibility but uh, I also think these are these are useful questions to ask um, so what barriers do individuals and households face um, when reducing food waste um, and how can their behavior change happen so this can be things that you find tricksy at home difficult um, but also maybe if you, you work in this this sector what are what are the, the real issues at a household level um, and of how do we, we, we get over those barriers? Uh, the second question is, what should the role of policymakers and legislators be? Um, what does policy and legislation look like for a zero food waste society? Um, how, how much intervention is needed and, and where and how? You can, we're gonna um, split you into groups. Um, so please feel free to answer one or, or both. Um, or, or to chuck them out entirely and talk about something uh, that that is um, that is is is, that is of more interest. And um, what I would like to ask though is if that there's a um, somebody in the group that can feedback um, at the end of the session. Um, so um, maybe feedback two things your your group felt was important, or that they'd just like to convey to everybody else and that can be around legislation policy making behavior change or some something else um, that comes at your discussions so can i ask for um one person from each group to to give us a really brief quick um summary um of that your your discussions um who would like to go first 
Go on, Alison, thank you. You're on mute. <laughs> Okay, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, right, yes, so in our small group, um, we, uh, we looked mostly at the, the first question, which was around um, behaviour change and what individuals, um, what, or what barriers individuals and, and households have. And one of the things we focused on um, was um, children. We felt that they weren't perhaps being taught enough um, in schools, um, you know, there's, there's cookery lessons that, that may happen, but there's certainly a lot more learning that could uh, could be undertaken in schools and from a younger age. So rather than perhaps just cooking lessons in senior school, what about kids learning about where their food comes from, from the age of five, six? Um, so that's something we, we, we thought might be important. Um, we also realised that another barrier is actually income. Um, and one thing we touched on was that there's a, an eat well plate um, that the government posts on their, their website that looks at what a typical person or child should be eating and how many people can afford to buy such a plate of food. Um, and that the, the number of people that could afford that um, is actually reducing. So that's, that's not good. Income and, and affordability is a, is a big barrier. Um, and of course, time and convenience as well, with families having lots of conflicting priorities, um, especially at the moment, if you're juggling home and work and maybe you're being self-employed or maybe you're employed by someone else, uh, maybe both. Um, maybe you're trying to homeschool kids or you have kids unexpectedly at home who might be at nursery. Maybe, you, you know, just just life with various things and priorities. Um, it can be difficult to find the time to to cook a meal from scratch. Um, so that was something that we, we thought about. Um, and one idea that was suggested was perhaps supermarkets could have a, a vegetable of the week or something, or some way of focusing on a particular food that recipes could then be, uh, could be suggested from there. Um, but yes, there's certainly a lot of um, barriers and we could have talked for a lot longer. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, some great points. Um, okay, who would like to go next? Come on, somebody, someone has to. <laughs> I nominate Emma from our group. There we go. <laughs> Emma. <laughs> Still on mute. Unmute. I'm, I'm unmuted now. My doesn't let me do it. Hi. <laughs> um, OK, so you've covered quite a bit on that one, actually. Um, I think in addition to that, I think we sort of touched on, you know, back to children and um, you know, children don't necessarily eat everything on their plate. So there's a lot of, you know, wastage then. You can't force your children to eat a particular meal. Um, and I don't want to eat leftovers all the time, you know, dog might not want it or things like that. So um, freezing is quite a good thing to do if you could, you know, perhaps think about what you could freeze. Even the things that you've you've cooked, you might have made a meal, but even things like bananas and things you can freeze and certain, you know, fruit that you can actually um, freeze itself. And it, it'd be useful to have lists of what you can and what you can't. And, and obviously people can find that, but I think it needs to be, Sort of made simple for people because um you know there's time again you know time is the big thing that we were talking about earlier and time you know not everybody's got time so um what else did we talk about i'm just trying to think <laughs> um we didn't actually sort of touch much on the second sort of question but that was mainly for the first question um brian is there anything that i've missed on that one i don't I'm just trying to think um i mean i, th I think the only thing i'd, I'd add, to, add to that was the the, the planning and, and helping people um, work work out what they they needed to go and buy before they went and uh, bought it, because that's that's really where it's in the purchasing of the stuff. Because it, people are buying more than they need, uh, they then don't necessarily store it properly. I mean, we 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 took most of our uh, two weekly shop straight in the freezer, as you've just mentioned, but it's because there's a plan there. And if you don't have a plan, how do you know what you're going to do with what when? 
but that's that, that's some education process, isn't it? It's, you know, uh, some uh, I think Alison talked about um, you know getting the, getting the kids on board with that early doors, um, you know, and, and understanding that that's really what we need to do. Otherwise, we'll we'll carry on doing the waste. I mean, my my parents, bless them, um, quite a long time gone now. You know, grew up in the war where it was it wasn't just an option to eat everything on the plate is you'd, you'd be going hungry if you didn't yeah <laughs> i know I, I need to be stricter with my children i think i was like you can't have your dessert until you've eaten that but you know after you said it about 50 times you, you know your patience wears you know then so it's, it's really there is a balance but talking about um children and you're saying about the education of children you know maybe something that the eco schools could sort of you know I mean, i'm sure they probably do do stuff on um you know food waste but you know it could be incorporated more in what they do and encouraging more schools to participate in the eco schools as well could be another thing great thank you these are all fantastic ideas i'm writing them down <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you emma thank you brian um next group I think maybe there's one more group is there Claire hi Claire I'm just going to volunteer because we couldn't volunteer in the breakout group and um, we didn't specifically um answer the questions but our comments ranged um first of all difficulty barriers to donating surplus food for example um food banks some of them only take tin goods rather than fresh goods um, potential lack of knowledge about where to donate um, surplus food, lack of connectivity between individuals who have excess that's potentially going to go off quite quickly and on people who can use it. Um, people not seeing the value of food because they're removed from the process of producing food. It's quite easy and can often be too cheap to go to a supermarket and buy packaged food that does, has very little value to a family, whereas if you produce it yourself, you've put the work in to grow the vegetables in your own garden you're not going to let it go to waste very easily because you you know what went the work behind it um, um and lack of knowledge within households of how to use odds and ends um for example um you know how to make your own stock or how those recipes you mentioned sounded really good about how to use up the stale bits of bread or the end slices that a lot of the kids don't want to eat and things like that. It's a lack of knowledge of, of how to use up scraps and things that might easily go in the compost bin. I think that was, um, I might have missed something, so anybody else can chip in from our group that uh, if I've missed something. Thank you so much, Claire. Brilliant. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to, to add? Uh, Catherine? I just wanted to add something Michael said, that he is trying to encourage people to reduce their waste. And Michael, you said something about you um, set a challenge and how much carbon mileage you could rack up making a meal. And I think that's a really fun way of looking at it because I'm reading a book with my son at the moment that's about carbon and it having to be restricted. So he was upset by the concept of reducing to eat to two hours a day. And I was like, I think that COVID is probably more difficult than that really at the moment. But um, I think that's a really interesting way of making things fun, making it a positive experience I think that from my perspective if you make this into an educational and positive experience that you're involved and engaged in what you're eating then people will um, take to it rather than making it into a like you've got to suffer because it's not really um, a, a, it's it's much more mindful if you turn it into a mindfulness exercise it, when it's about well-being I think that's um, yeah a really positive way forwards but I think policy obviously needs to kind of um, counteract that. So in, for instance, the big thing I noticed about moving to South Cambridgeshire is the fact we have a green bin. And if you've got a green bin, then you're gonna think about where the waste goes. Um, and if you open up that question, then hopefully if people have the time, if they're not overworked and you know overstressed, then there is gonna be more consideration because the environment really lends itself to that. Whereas in places like central London, it doesn't lend itself to thinking about where waste goes because of the way that everything is structured. Um, yeah, so, you know, those opportunities to use wormeries and to build your own compost pits. I think scientifically, that's an interesting process, but 
yeah I think I mean personally I'm really into this idea of compost and I think theoretically it's a wonderful idea so it's tapping into that I'll stop there thank you (laughs) Catherine that's fantastic and yes you're absolutely correct fun and making it a positive experience will always engage people more than finger wagging and telling them they mustn't mustn't do things so yes it's always being mindful of that when we we're talking to others um we are a run out of time does anybody have any sort of very pressing questions that they might like to ask brian or myself or b um obviously you can get in touch with us um outside of this and um well, I'm, I'm offering Brian <laughs> Brian's uh, time, but uh, you can contact myself or B at uh, any time. Um, I think these dropped our contact. So sort it of goes with the territory that people can contact me if, they, if they'd you like contact to. contact Brian. <laughs> um, so unless there's any sort of burning questions, um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for um, coming along. Um, great to see you, and um, I hope to see you or work with some of you um, again in the near future. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Bye.